Hi, welcome to the next in our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. Um, today we're going to be talking about one particular antenna type because it's good to introduce an antenna and sort of get a handle on what it is, what it looks like, before we go on and talk more generally about properties of antennas. So the type of antenna type we're going to be talking about is a short dipole antenna, also called a Hertzian dipole. Um, if you're following along in my class, all of, the, of this is in Chapter 9.1 of your textbook. As we talked about last time, antennas are devices that optimize to control emitted radiation from a circuit. And we see, saw there were a lot of different antenna design factors I'm not going to go into in today's lecture. And that also we could classify antennas in sort of two general categories, current and aperture antennas. It turns out the Hertzian dipole antenna is a current antenna because the radiation from the dipole antennas we'll see originates from a time-varying current. So let's see how this works. The Hertzian dipole antenna really is just our bent transmission lines we talked about last time. Um, we talk about a short or Hertzian dipole under particular conditions. Um, essentially what we say for Hertzian dipole is that the length of the antenna, in other words, from the top of the bend to the bottom of the bend, which we're going to call D in all the notation that follows, is much, much less, that distance is much, much less than the wavelength on the transmission line. Um, that factor of much, much less is usually like a factor of about 50. So really the antenna is very, very short compared to one spatial cycle of the field. And the reason that we put this condition on for the simple antenna is that over a very small fraction of a wavelength, the voltage does not change very much. Um, or the current does not change very much equivalently. So essentially anywhere on this dipole we're going to have the same current. So let's see how this works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a whole series of these dipoles as a function of time. So time is going this way along the bottom axis there. And so think about these dipoles as one of these flip books you used to make um, when you were a kid where you draw pictures that were slightly changed on a bunch of sheets of paper and then as you flipped them you saw what happened. At our first instance of time we're going to basically take a snapshot where the current is in a maximum direction and it's essentially flowing up in that direction. So there's a current flowing that way, that way on the transmission line, as well as that way and that way on the trans transmission line. At some later point in time while the current is still near the peak, we're getting sort of to the downward part of our wave. and the, the amplitude of the current is starting to drop, but still we have the same current, although less, um, in both arms of our dipole antenna. Um, as we go still later in time, the currents drop to zero. We're now essentially at one of the zero crossings of the sine wave. As we get later in time, the current starts to grow, but is going in the opposite direction. So now our current is starting to flow downward in our antenna structure, but both arms have the same current because the length of this is much less than the spatial change of the current or voltage in the circuit, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. I can just sort of fill out the rest of the flipbook now. Essentially what we're going to see is we're going to see an oscillating current that goes up and down and up and down as time goes on. But every at any point in time, this current is essentially the same on the dipole antenna. Um, we make that assumption because the dipole is very small compared to a wavelength. It has essentially constant current. Now it turns out that you, you calculate um, the radiated electromagnetic and electric and magnetic fields using Maxwell's equations, but the most common derivation that I've decided I'm not going to go into because it doesn't really add a lot of transparency uh, comes from the magnetic vector potential. So essentially here are Maxwell's equations. Here's our antenna where we assume that it's oriented in the z direction, so the antenna points in the z direction. And essentially what we do is we can then write the magnetic vector potential using our integral expression right here, um, where essentially we're defining the current distribution, which in fact is in the z direction, it's just a straight line, as well as a phase term um, where we have to integrate over the antenna in the general case. It turns out, of course, that because we've made the assumption that the antenna is very small compared to a wavelength, um, we can do a lot of simplification instead of having a current that varies spatially. We just basically say um, the overall current is the, the current that flows in the wire times the length of the dipole. And then once we make this approximation to the magnetic vector potential, um, we essentially can go in and then take the curl of this expression to calculate the um, magnetic flux vector. Once we get the magnetic flux vector, we can then 
take the temporal derivative and basically relate that to the curl of the electric field. A lot of algebra, and so rather than go through it, I'm just going to give you what those fields are. When we go through all of that, this is essentially what we come up with. We come up with one magnetic field, H, and two different components of the electric field. In reality, of course, there's just one electric field, but we can separate it um, into two different components due to superposition. You'll notice that we have kind of a strange notation here that I haven't talked about before. The magnetic field is given in terms of the var variable phi, and the electric field is given in terms of the variable r and the variable theta. This is because this derivation works in spherical coordinates, which I've tried very, very hard to avoid up to now. But we can no longer skip this, so let's look into spherical coordinates just a little bit. In spherical coordinates, we work in situations where things have spherical symmetry, which, which kind of makes sense because we assume, at least in the symbol case, our radiation can propagate spherically out in all directions. Essentially, here's our coordinate axis system. Here's our x-axis. Here's our y-axis. Our z-axis is pointing up in that direction right there. And our little antenna is oriented along the z-direction with a length given by d. We define the variable phi to be in, at least in this case, the xy plane, and phi is called the azimuth. It goes essentially around in this direction, and you can see it hopefully on the video by the green lines and the variable phi. And so if we think of some point we want to point to on the sphere, so we want to draw a vector um, that goes from the origin right here out to this point on the sphere, one of the coordinates we used to basically mark that point is how far on the azimuthal plane from the x-axis it is. Another way that we can basically, a second coordinate in other words, we can measure the position of that point on the sphere is through the angle theta. This is from the z-axis down to the line that points from the origin out to this point out here. And our, of course our final um, direction is pointing out away from the center of the sphere and is the, ve the direction r that points from the origin to the point we're looking at. So if we look at these three coordinates, um, essentially what we have is the phi coordinate, the azimuthal coordinate, essentially pointing around the equator of the sphere, the theta coordinate essentially pointing from the north pole going downward, um, determined by the angle theta, and the r component pointing normally out away from the surface of the sphere or out away from the center. Um, this is a perfectly valid coordinate system. It's used to solve certain types of problems like this antenna um, problem, but I don't like to use it very much because if we were to move to a different point on the sphere, say over here, then essentially theta would be pointing that way, r would be pointing that way, phi would be pointing that way, and you run into all kinds of problems when you try to do computational problems in spherical coordinates because your vector system changes depending on what point you're looking at. Unlike the Cartesian coordinate system, x, y, and z, where things always point in the same direction. Well, now that we understand this coordinate system, let's go and look at these three equations a, a little bit more closely. Um, they're quite complicated looking, but they're actually not that bad. They depend on things we know about. D, the length of anten the antenna. I, how much current's flowing in it. Um, KR, where R is just the distance out to the point we're measuring. And K is 2 pi over lambda. Um, and we've also got some KR terms here, as well as the sine of theta, which simply says that the amount of electric and magnetic fields is going to vary as either the sine or the cosine of theta. We notice something else really interesting, that everything in the square brackets, i.e. these terms right here, um, are first, second, and third order terms. So if we look at, let me stop here and erase some of these lines before I go on. There, that's better. So, so if we look in the brackets here, um, we notice we have terms that are some kind of power law or inverse power law of the distance r we are from the antenna to the point out here we're measuring on the sphere. Um, in the magnetic field we have a 1 over r term and we also have a 1 over r squared term. In the electric field that points radially out away from the center of the sphere, e sub r, we've got a square term and a cubic term and in the electric field in the theta direction, um, we have a 1 over r term, a 1 over r squared term, and a 1 over r cube term. Cube term. Well, 
the argument we make is that if we're close to the dipole antenna, all these three terms matter a lot. We have electric fields that point in two directions and a magnetic field that points in one direction. But if you recall our argument about plane waves, if we move far away from the source, everything becomes a plane wave. So if R is big enough, um, this term is going to become negligible compared to that term. Similarly, this term and this term also become negligible compared to the 1 over r terms because 1 over r squared and 1 over r cubed are a lot smaller than 1 over r. Similarly, we can neglect those terms as well in the case we're far away. Then for our simple dipole antenna, we have what's called the far field approximation, where far field means we're so far away from it, everything looks like a plane wave. Um, in this case, we simply have a magnetic field and an electric field. And if you look at these, they're actually related by that term right there, which is basically the impedance of free space. Um, so we essentially have a plane wave type of propagation where we simply haven't written the e to the i omega t term we would expect in a plane wave. But other than that, we have just the phase relationship where the phase changes we propagate out away from the, the antenna. It's worth looking at these equations a little bit more closely and looking at the dependence on theta. We know the sine of theta term is going to be zero when theta is equal to zero, and it's going to rise to a maximum when theta is equal to one. So if we actually look at this sine of theta term, you can see that in the direction pointing straight up above the dipole antenna up here, that theta is going to be equal to zero, and we're going to have no magnetic or electric field. However, at an angle basically perpendicular to the dipole, say out in that direction, theta is going to be 90 degrees and both the magnetic and the electric fields are going to be maximal. This kind of makes a lot of sense from what we'd expect since our current is flowing up and down in that direction and we would expect from the hand waving arguments we made that the fields are going to propagate out in that direction and we might expect some fall off of the fields as we get to be above the antenna. Um, it turns out that lots of people have used these equations to calculate the electric and magnetic fields from a dipole antenna. Those are on the next slide, so let's take a look. Essentially, they look like this, where in this diagram that I copied directly from the dipole Wikipedia page, the magnetic field is shown by the red lines, the electric field is shown by the blue lines, and you can see essentially that you have this kind of strange dependence, but you really can think about this dipole antenna and radiation coming off spherically in that direction with the electric fields essentially being perpendicular to the direction of propagation on all sides, the magnetic fields also being perpendicular to the direction of propagation, and of course E cross H is perpendicular to itself. The Another way that we often express the pattern of radiation from a dipole antenna is through a surface that looks like this. Essentially what we do is we put a sphere around the dipole antenna and let the radius be equal to the amplitude. So if this is the center, out here, radially, the value is very big. But as we go out here, essentially the arrows get smaller and smaller and we get no radiation um, from the dipole going in this direction because you'll notice the, the the term drops down to zero, as you can imagine, in the middle of the toroid. You kind of have to get used to this. This is a difficult thing to look at. So let's stop for a second um, and end the video with essentially a movie from a site you can go to, which is the Falstad site, where you can set up a Java applet and essentially look at a radiating dipole antenna, examine it in more detail, and get a look at it. So I'm going to stop here and end with a narrated video where I simply recorded the Falstad site. So this is the simulation of the applet I just showed you. Essentially, I've got the stop button checked right now, so nothing's moving. Um, I've set it up to only show the electric field, and we don't see any charge in space, so we're not going to see that. That's what row corresponds to. And I've also set up by basically choosing my source here, an oscillating dipole antenna. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncheck the stop button. You'll see things moving through space. And it's important to look at what's going on. Essentially, the color represents the strength of the electric field with white being the strongest field, green being weaker, and the direction of the electric field, if you can see it, is shown by these little tiny arrows. So let's go ahead and start it and see what happens. You can see that as the dipole radiates, the electric field in one region switches direction. It goes from um, up to down to up to down. You also see that it varies sinusoidally because these white regions sort of uh, propagate outward, and you've got regions where there's no electric field, the nodes of the 
of the electric field lines. You also get a sense of the radiation pattern that you saw previously, that nothing goes up and down in the direction of the dipole, and most of the radiation goes out sideways. And I urge you to go and play with this applet so you can get a better sense and an intuitive feel of the field radiated from small antennas.